the roots of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can This is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machine to Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's discussion and our guest, we want to mention just real quick, we have a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. If you want, consider tossing us a buck a month there. Today, we're joined by Rocco Gangle, professor of philosophy at Endicott College, author of Francois Laroel's Philosophies of Difference, a Critical Introduction and Guide. Translator. Or no, that's the guide. You you could start with he translated it, right? But no, I'm sorry, Coop. <laughs> I'm trying to do a show here. <laughs> also, Diagrammatic Eminence, Category Theory and Philosophy, co-author of Iconicity and Abduction, and co-editor of Superpositions, Laruel and the Humanities. His research focuses on semiotics, diagrammatic logic, metaphysics, and political philosophy. Welcome back to the show, Rocky. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Really enjoyed your last visit the episode we had with Eric yeah. from way back. I'll have to post that in the show notes, but yeah, I really enjoyed that discussion. So we're glad to have you one-on-one -on -one to yeah, discuss. I think the background, at least for back. the background discussion today for the listener is going to be autopoiesis and eigenform from Louis H. Kaufman. Maybe it's Louis or is it Louis? Louis? I don't Louis? Know. Yeah, I think know. it's Louis. I'm not sure. I think, is, I think he goes. I mean, it's funny. We'll call him Louis. We'll call him Louis, man. <laughs> Just leave it to Louis. Give me a yeah. break. He cites a Kaufman in, in the paper. You think that's a relation or maybe that's... I think he was Scott. citing himself, right? No, it was no, like there's, Scott there's a Stuart, Kaufman. A Stuart, Stuart Kaufman. Kaufman. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty, I don't think they're related. But I think it's like 1F. Okay, yeah. Anyway, also, as I mentioned, as I rudely interrupted Cooper, you're also a translator. You translated the book that you wrote the guide for, right? Um, Philosophies of Difference by Francois Laura Well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I haven't really talked about it, I guess, too much on the show or even on Twitter, but uh, we are co translating a book that's in review now and forthcoming, hopefully sooner than later. But uh, Laura Well's non standard philosophy, subtitle to be determined, you know, who knows how they, <laughs> they want to handle that. But uh, but no, that's um, we've been talking for for years. But I mentioned before the show, I don't know if I've ever gotten the uh, the rundown, the spiel of your of your origin story, which we like to to have our guests run through. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got into whether it be philosophy or into this particular area that you find yourself in. You can throw in maybe where Laura Well comes into that picture. You can throw in your academic journey, just whatever you want to, whatever picture you want to paint for the listener, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. First off, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me. It's great to be back here. Looking forward to talking about this autopoiesis stuff. That's the the project that I'm working on most closely right now. It's a, a book on autopoiesis that I'm working on with uh, two Long-standing collaborators, John Luca Caterina, who's also here at Endicott, and uh, Fernando Tomei, who's an economist and mathematician in Argentina. It's hard to know how far, how far back to to begin, but um, back. Yeah. I, I would say the origins of my interest in all of this stuff um, go back to as long as I can remember a kind of fascination with. I guess what you could call mystical phenomena. But mm -hmm. even as a little kid, I always was was very interested in the idea of God, in the idea of being able to connect to something, some kind of infinite beyond that always kind of fascinated me. I've read accounts of mystical experiences. I always wanted to have mystical experience. And that I think was the source of my interest in philosophy. And in college, I was somewhat disappointed in the philosophy courses that I took. 
they just didn't seem to speak to this more kind of speculative um, and existential, I guess, interest and uh, courses in religion did. So I was a, uh, a religion major, even though I was always in some ways more interested in philosophy. And then I guess maybe the turning point was some years after college, after I'd taught English for a year in Korea, I was hanging out on a, on a beach in Thailand, basically smoking marijuana and reading Thomas Pynchon and trying to figure out what I was going to do next. It was one of these, I had plenty of time to just reflect on kind of what I wanted to do. And I, I thought about it and deliberated and decided I really wanted to go back to school and go to graduate school in religious studies. I went through that whole process, ended up at the University of Virginia in the religion program there, which was a wonderful place to be, and then wrote my dissertation on Spinoza. So I was doing philosophy, but in the context of a religion PhD program. And I've always been interested in the, the more formal side of philosophy and, and formal logic and mathematics and trying to find some kind of synthesis with maybe the more mystical elements, mm -hmm. which is why Spinoza is such a kind of natural right. place to go. I love the line of Spinoza, Nietzsche, Deleuze. And my PhD supervisor was Peter Oakes, who's a, uh, a Jewish theologian and philosopher who works a lot on Peirce. And he introduced me really to Peirce and to Peirce's existential graphs. And I was very lucky when I got this job here at Endicott 17 years ago, the year after I arrived, they brought in this new mathematics professor, uh, an Italian guy, Gianluca Caterina, and he and I immediately became friends. We started working on bad use being an event together, right. which is a book I always wanted to work through and didn't have the mathematical chops. I was very lucky to find a mathematician who was just as interested in somebody like Badiou. We worked through Badiou. We worked through Paul Cohen's original work together, just line by line. And uh, the stuff on forcing, right? On forcing, exactly. That was our first paper together. Our first kind of work was expressing forcing in Peirce's existential graphs. And that was a, kind of a, a funny story that we, there was a, a logic conference in Brazil. And we both wanted to go to Brazil. So we sent the abstract to the conference saying, our paper represents Paul Cohen's forcing technique in Peirce's gamma graphs. The abstract was accepted. And then we kind of looked at each other. And went, well, I guess we have to figure out how to do this. Right. Oh, fuck. Now we have to, now we have to write the paper. <laughs> which right. Is, which I think there's a nice logic to that in the academic world. You, you, you send out promissory notes and then you actually do the work to fulfill the promise that you lay out. That's really been one of the main research programs that I've been working on now for, for 15 years or so, especially with John Luca. And then we were joined with Fernando actually at that conference in Brazil. That's where we first met him. And it's just been an incredibly rewarding part of my professional and personal life to have a couple of collaborators who are both, you know, brilliant people to work with, but also friends and this formal stuff. It wasn't completely my cup of tea, but more and more it's become my cup of tea. My background is much more in continental philosophy, but more and more I really appreciate being able to prove a theorem. That's always, I think, a, a drawback of continental philosophy is it's it's filled with brilliant people and and profound insight, but sometimes the cogs don't catch. Everything requires a certain a certain kind of faith-based intuition that what's being said here is important and relevant. You can't immediately demonstrate its importance. You just kind of have to feel it. There's something deeply satisfying about being able to to construct a monad. That was yeah. something we, we built. A, a It's a, a category theory structure called a monad. And that was, it was so much fun a few years ago. Like I built, I built my monad. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can, you can only do that metaphorically in continental philosophy. I mean, there, there's something about, you know, that love of Spinoza that, that ties these things together. Right. I mean, the sort of the interest in mysticism and obviously he goes by way of sort of working through it rigorously in a way to constantly demystify, but you still are left with this feeling of, you know, cosmogenesis and wonder, but then you've also got the, the geometric method, right? 
it is kind of marrying those two sides of your interests. I think it's still one of the great fractures in modern civilization is, you know, what C.P. Snow called the, the division between the two cultures that people, people tend to identify as either a, a science, math, STEM person or a humanities person. People treat it as if it's a priori necessary to think mm. of these things as distinct. But if you go back to someone like Proclus in the ancient world, it would have, it would have seemed insane to hold separate an interest in mathematics from an interest in platonic metaphysics, say, right? That of course, these things are part of the same structure of, of intellectual insight and, and labor. You know, it's funny because Laruel riffs off of the, uh, the, the writing above the academy. He is not a geometer. How does it go again? Uh, if you're not a geometer, get the fuck out. Uh, but no, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But uh, so obviously you see that to be able to get initiated into the, the platonic forms, you have to understand geometry. You have to be familiar with the Timaeus or, you know, and then, you know, with, with the Mino, we're kind of, it's all reminiscence or something. But anyway, uh, I like that. And something that struck me at the end of this paper, which we're going to talk about, this paper by Kaufman, where he kind of turns to this notion of autopoiesis as ontopoiesis and as a kind of genesis of the universe from itself. That that last sentence in this paper that we read for today, which we can um, at least link the the full title to and maybe maybe some way that that it can be uh, accessed for for listeners we'll figure that out but in any case this this kind of turn towards this notion of um of the cosmos generating itself from itself there was something some bit of that mysticism or that interest in in the mystical or that that gesturing toward the beyond that reminded me of your uh, of your origin story i love the introduction of the term gesture because it seems to me that's a really useful way maybe to start to think about some of these more formal constructions that a gesture is a meaning making artifact, but it's not linguistic. It's not exactly syntactic. It's expressive and it's formal. That's where I think often mathematics is misunderstood as a science of numbers. Right? Mm. And of course, mm -hmm. numbers are important, but mathematics isn't about number, it's ultimately about form. And, and in that sense, the formal gestures by which the universe gives rise to various objects and structures and relations are mathematical in themselves, in the sense that they are forms, right? And this is why autopoiesis is even plausible as an object of study, because nothing makes itself in the absolute literal sense of, you know, when a thing is a thing, there are efficient causes that are not that thing that have brought it into being. But if we think of a thing as a complex of relations, right, or a set of dispositions to respond to various stimuli, then we've immediately quasi formalized the thing right each thing is in some sense a form and thus is already constituted as a gesture i think this term gesture is a really nice it's kind of percy in, in the way that you described it yeah <laughs> the way yeah. that you yeah. kind of riffed off of what I, I i threw out there and i really appreciate that and uh you're starting to walk us into we're, we're starting at the shallow end but we're starting to, to talk about autopoiesis and i know that I wasn't familiar with the very original paper by Maturana, Uribe, and, and Varela. I've always heard, it's always been Maturana and Varela that have, that have been paired together. So I was mm -hmm. unfamiliar with this third collective member of the, the group. And so I, I do want to include Uribe's name in there just because we've been talking about work in collectives obviously like this podcast is collective you and i are translating a work together you have you're writing a paper with two other people so like this notion of i don't know why for me it's always 
seem like that third member drops out. That's an aside, but this notion of autopoiesis of a kind of, I don't know if we took the words literally a self-fashioning or a self-creating, whether it be of, of forms, of systems. I know that it's interesting because the author, Lewis or, or Louis, as we'll lovingly nickname him, <laughs> uh, he turns to, uh, I thought this was a cool gesture. He turns to chat GPT to generate the definition or a rough definition of autopoiesis. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciated that kind of gesture, especially after finishing the paper and kind of thinking back how that has implications for something we've roughly discussed, at least between the two of us, Coop. But on the show, we've brought up LLMs, right? The large language models or whatever the fuck, and whether or not there's validity there. But just thinking about that type of collation of data and the and the types of algorithms that are involved with that but in any case yeah i guess we could start with i know that he first uses the chat gpt description and then gives their formal definition which i thought was interesting because it is much more succinct obviously than a chatbot might be but uh Maybe we don't have to run through verbatim what they are, but you started gesturing, I'll use that word now, towards a sort of working definition of autopoiesis. But how do you see it sort of when you think about this? Or how would you maybe describe this like to your students? Or how do you talk about this with your collective group? I think there's a little bit of a historical genealogy in the concept. Maturana and Varela were both Chilean biologists, and they were interested in abstracting from the complexity of living systems the form of life itself right Mm -hmm. so they introduced this concept of autopoiesis as a a kind of abstraction from living materials and especially the the living cell so for them autopoiesis is a characteristic of a cell roughly speaking it's the the way in which a cell defines itself through a membrane that separates an interior from its environment and through the chemical reactions within the cell with its organelles and so forth is capable of reproducing both the membrane and the interior capacities of the cell to reproduce both those capacities and the membrane so right so there's a kind of infinite recursion just at work in the structure. Like, what is a cell? A cell is a thing constituted by a membrane and an interior that is capable of using the capacities of the interior to reproduce the membrane and the interior, which is capable of reproducing, et cetera, et cetera. So for them, autopoiesis is just a structure that characterizes how a cell maintains itself and reproduces itself. But then that same concept, once they had identified it, and developed it in the context of evolutionary biology, took on a kind of autonomy and linked up with thinkers like von Neumann, who were working more in terms of formal systems and automata and robotics and cybernetics. And it turns out that this is some something like exactly the concept that was wanted for thinking about certain emergent phenomena in cybernetic systems. And so What I find exciting about this concept of autopoiesis is it is sufficiently abstract to cover both life and in in thinkers like Niklas Luhmann, who's a German sociologist, he puts autopoiesis right at the center of his theory of society. So you have a concept that can cover living things, it can cover social systems, but it also can characterize purely formal structures like cellular automata. And just, you know, mathematically, it can be a way to characterize dynamic systems that introduce through their dynamical rules structures that are capable of reproducing the structures that are capable of reproducing the structures and so on. It's a tremendously fertile concept that is that is live and at work in very different domains and seems to suggest ways that these disparate domains might connect with one another, right? Of course, this is one of the great issues of our 
contemporary conjuncture is the relationship between technology and technical phenomena and artificial intelligence and human beings and society and the biopolitical and culture. And so rather than, than trying to bridge those two domains as if they were separate, and then how do we get them together, right? Maybe thinking of some kind of like notion of the cyborg or the prosthetic, autopoiesis is a, is a way to generalize. We understand autopoiesis, we understand what is happening in technical phenomena and in society and in biology and in all these different kind of dynamical systems. I thought it was interesting reading this as we get deeper into the paper. I reminded of an episode that Coop and I did a couple months back on Rouye's neo-finalism. Rouye is, I, I think, a thinker that kind of reminds me of, I think he would fit in very well here because he gestures towards the Gnostic, towards that sort of mystical outside, while at the same time being deeply ingrained in and and interested in biological phenomenon, morphogenesis, etc. And he kind of has this line, this quip where he's like, he's like, look, the embryo is sort of, I'm not gonna say he says it's better, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, the embryo is is kind of smarter than the brain because it knows how to make brains. And it reminded me of when Louis Kaufman is, is going into, <laughs> into this. For example, one of the first examples, not the first, but one of the first, he, he goes into how DNA replicates and self-replicates. And there's a sense in which, and this is what I kind of asked about earlier, but there's a sense in which there is this question of, I don't know if we need to go to this just yet, but there is the sense of in autopoiesis, a blueprint that is a part of the replication scheme for some of this dynamic structuration that you're describing. I was immediately thinking about kind of Rouye's, like thinking about, you know, the embryo is pretty clever. You know, it knows how to make all these these things, you know, we think of organs and again, not to get the Lusian and body without organs and all that shit, but we think about like organs and the specialization of the organs, but there's, you know, Deleuze always had this fascination with the larval subject and with the egg and with embryogenesis because it can create all these specialized organs. So there's something about like this notion of a blueprint along with the machinery and the assembling that I found fascinating. And I was, I guess I was trying to gesture towards my question to you, if, if I was using the phrase right, you brought up von Neumann, this von Neumann building machine, if that was like a part of the matrix of this idea of a blueprint created along with or in tandem with the autopoetic maneuvering. I think von Neumann saw this very clearly and actually developed a pretty rich understanding of this prior to DNA as discovered by by Watson and Crick. So even, right. even before DNA, von Neumann, just thinking formally about the conditions of possibility for a self-reproducing machine and uh, developed the notion that such a machine would have to bifurcate into something like a blueprint for the machine and the machine itself. And so the blueprint has to Reproduce has to, has to have instructions for building the thing. Von Neumann was really thinking of, you know, imagine almost like a robot built out of girders and joints and wheels, and it moves <laughs> around in an environment and picks up girders, picks up joints, welds them together so as to build a copy of itself. But that's not going to be sufficient. It's going to somehow have to code within the system of girders and wheels a blueprint which is no longer just a thing, no longer just a mechanical device to move around and gather girders, but a series of instructions. So mm -hmm. encoded information about what to do. This is essentially how DNA works, right? DNA mm -hmm. is a code that explains how to build proteins and brains and everything. It's a bunch of instructions chemically about how to make stuff, but it also encodes how to reproduce itself as a code. And so it's more than a metaphor. It's not just that these things are similar. It's that the way DNA works seems to conform to what is a priori necessary to construct a machine that is capable both of physically building itself and repeating 
the information that is required to follow the steps that are required to rebuild itself. You need this bifurcation into both information and activity, let's say. Right. I don't want to bring up Simon too much and like overcode the discussion, but this reminds me of the way in which he thinks about individuals and individuation as, you know, he defines sort of individuals based on the systems of information that are sort of uh, aligned with them. He's trying to think through, even on like the biological level, for example, looking at sponges and like colonies of sponges, he's like, where where does the individual start? Where's the colony? And so there's something about this question of an informational matrix, this programming of code along with the blueprint. So a transmission, if you will, of the blueprint that I found relevant and, and interesting in a certain way. And that if his dissertation, what is written in 58. So DNA was just sort of being outlined. And so, and obviously, Maturana and Varela hadn't yet coined autopoiesis, but like he's working sort of on the edges of this to a certain extent, because when I was, when I was reading through the way that, as you were just discussing the, um, the way that DNA works and the way that, uh, that Kaufman was, was working through how DNA is able to draw on what he calls just the environment. And I think Simon Don would call like the pre-individual milieu in order to, to work, because you already mentioned the cell and its, and its uh, membrane and whatnot. It made me feel like there's something inherent in this notion of autopoiesis and self-replication and the way that this author works through that extends and breathes back a lot more life into some of Simon Doan's investigations. That connection is rife with possibilities for, for research. I mean, this is something I'm, I'm very interested in, in trying to work through in the book as well. I, I just picked up recently the, um, the new translation of Simone Doan's lectures, I think from the 60s, it's called uh, Imagination and Invention. What I really appreciate there is this idea that there's almost a kind of life cycle to the image. Simone Doan really wants to, to develop the concept of image as a, as a kind of almost like a living thing, that an image is not a representation, but is a structure that develops autonomously, right? It's almost like a, almost like a parasite organism with respect to the, say, the brains or the minds that think it or conceive mm -hmm. it, right? So mm -hmm. an image lives in us, which is, I think, phenomenologically true. We don't control those images. Images take possession of us, right? And they- It's uh, thinking like the meme or some shit, right? It's, it's oh, very yeah. much like, yeah, but but with this really, right, this this sense of passing was, into just different- I thinking Baudrillard, simulation and simulacra, like the simulacra are these kind of recursive things that kind of take on their own life. That's where I was going with some of this. In Simondo, what I love is the idea, an image, if it sort of lives out its natural lifespan, turns into a technology that every image matures into a tool. I haven't yet looked at, at that volume, so you're, you're piquing my interest. I mean, I, it's just, there's always like a, a laundry list of, of things to read, and it would be good to pick that up. And I'm, I'm already thinking about how that might extend and complicate, you know, matter and memory. Because Bergson is trying to find that sweet spot between realism and idealism in this ontology of the image. So maybe I'm far off base with what Simon Dunn does in those lectures, but that's what it made me, me think of. This really reminds me of a, the conversation Taylor and I had a few weeks ago about Freud's The Mystic Writing Pad. And like, I guess the, the unconscious kind of being an example of this membrane and then this, this recursivity and becomes the repetition of the generation for the unconscious. I don't know, I thought that was like an interesting little connection about how important like this concept of the membrane being erected and then that allows for this sort of self, this like auto bootstrapping of whatever the system is or, you know, I don't quite have that sorted out yet. And I think, we, again, that what's fascinating there is this internal bifurcation right. between the thing and the activity. The impression is an act, but mm. it also is the result of that act, which is something like the let, let's say the letter, like the Lacanian kind of letter or imprint mm. or or image. And this is exactly at the heart, I think, of these mathematical models of autopoiesis is the the duality that is at the heart of all mathematics 
between the operation and the name. Take a function. What do we do in mathematics? We say, okay, here's a function. Let's call it F. But as soon as we've called it F, as soon as it has the name, then we can operate on its name. We can take the derivative of the function, F prime. This ability to do something, but then in doing it, to give a name to that doing so that that operation can then become an operand of further operations. Once that possibility opens up, and, and in some sense, yeah, as you've suggested, Cooper, like that, that might be the, the core of the unconscious, right? Maybe this, this is why writing is at the, the heart of, of thinking and the unconscious and experience that somewhere deep, deep in the metaphysical undergrowth, there is a doing that stamps a name such that the doing can become a thing subject to further doings. And once you have that reflexivity, you have a kind of lever for recursivity. Everything follows from that. Everything follows from this, this duality of operation and, and name. It almost even reminds me of like, I mean, Deleuze's this whole thing about the creation of concepts. Like that's kind of a similar process in play, right? You generate a new concept and then that becomes a new operator or operand. The naming, and I was thinking of being an event where, where Badu is left with this conundrum, whether uh, the naming of the event is, is like, you know, a secondary event that, that sort of echoes it. And, uh, you know, in order to, as though there were fidelity to the event, and then it's in the naming that we draw out the consequences of it. In any case, yeah, I, I'm sure we could go to a lot of different different places. I, I do think that there's something there with what Cooper suggested and what you responded with, Rocky, about writing in the unconscious. And um, obviously, there is iteration at the heart of it, right? Because it's Freud is deeply concerned with this question of of repetition, which seems to be at the at the heart of of autopoiesis. I mean, we talked about replication, but there is involved in this, these iterative structures. And perhaps that's maybe where we can go to, to introduce this notion of eigenform. I know that's a broadly set up question, piss poor performance on my part, but I'm just thinking <laughs> about the other part of the, the title of the essay, this notion of an, of an eigenform that involves what a kind of an identity between something and this iterative or self iterative process, but I'll let you maybe give a, a more, a clearer definition. So this is the concept that I think that Kaufman really wants to introduce. I mean, I okay. think there are other, other thinkers who have used the term, but it's, it's not, it's not really a, a standard term in the literature, the way that autopoiesis is. The idea is that an eigenform is a correlative concept to a given operation. So we assume that we have some operation, let's call it T for transformation, right? So think of T as just a, a machine that works on some input and generates some output. So T is just, a, is just a generic operation that transforms inputs into outputs. An eigenform for T for a given operation is going to be anything such that when you plug it in as input, T spits out as output exactly the same thing. In linear algebra, there's the idea of an eigenvector. So mm -hmm. you have a vector space, you know, think of these as arrows pointing in all these different directions with different intensities or, or magnitudes. And you know, then you have some linear transformation. So you take the, the space of these vectors and then you move it around. You kind of squish it or squash it or, or reflect it. You fix one of these transformations and it, it can be the case that certain vectors remain on their same line. They're still pointing in the same direction. And if they change, they change only in magnitude or intensity. They get longer or shorter, right? But they're still pointing in the same direction. If that happens, under a certain transformation, that's an eigenvector. So it reminds me of I, the of the brick and the mold kind of the the clay and the mold and the forces when it comes out. You still depending on like 
how strong the mold is, you'll have some resistance back from the clay. Like if you make a wooden mold, there's more resistance. If you make an iron cast mold, you have less. But if that that concept of the of the same, right? I suppose is that the word eigen in in German? Is it related to the sameness or exactly? Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, go on, go on, please. So that's basically it. It's just by definition, an eigen form is a something that when plugged into a transformation or operation spits out the same thing. So another term for this would be a fixed point. The conceptual difference between eigenform and fixed point is that a fixed point is, is represented just as a single thing, right? It's, it's usually identified maybe with a, a letter or a name, f of x equals x, therefore mm -hmm. x is a fixed point. Whereas an eigenform conceptually is the structure of x such that when f operates on it, you end up with something that is the same. And the specific twist that Kaufman gives on this idea is that an eigenform is not only relative to an operation, but also relative to some observer. A nice example, kind of motivated example of, of an eigenform under the operation of throwing a piece of gravel onto a heap. So if you have three pieces of gravel, and then you operate, throw one new piece of gravel, you have something different. So what would be a definition, perhaps, of a heap of gravel? How do you know once you've reached a heap? Well, a heap would be something such that when you throw one piece of gravel on the heap, you still have the same heap relative to an observer. You've added one more piece of gravel. It's not the same. It's not identical. But it is an eigenform for me because my perceptive apparatus is incapable of distinguishing heap before operation and heap after. This is classic paradox shit. The paradox of the heap of the sorties paradox, except mm -hmm. in the, in the yeah. paradox, you're removing pieces, but the, the logic holds the same in terms of the eigenform logic. One of the examples that Kaufman uses is, um, you know, when you have two mirrors in a room, yeah. like we've all been in a bathroom in a hotel that's like this. And then you, you know, you see an infinite series of, of reflections of yourself in both in both directions. Well, you can distinguish you if you look down the hallway of bathrooms, right? If you look too deep, well, then the reflection of that appears as the third hallway, right? Or the third room. And then the reflection of that, the fourth room. You can distinguish each of those, but somewhere kind of off at the horizon. There's some point at which you get such a long hallway of rooms that even if you add one more, so you ref you have the reflection of that hallway, sure, you get one more, but you can't really tell that anything new has happened. That's the moment that you've achieved the eigenform. The eigenform is this local stability or equilibrium for some observer of some recursive operation. It's an interestingly kind of triadic structure, right? It's not just a fixed point. A fixed point would be a sort of special case of an eigenform. An eigenform is something that works like a fixed point for some observer of the recursive operation. And so it, it, it draws in this, let's say, this experiential or perceptual or observable dimension, which is, I think, the unique take of Kaufman on this stuff. Because otherwise everything was just would, you know, formally it, with a function, a fixed point is just a point such that f of x is equal to x. And that would be a case of an eigenform. But the interesting thing is to say, well, in in phenomena that aren't quite completely formal or completely mathematical, like a living being, to what extent are you invariant under the operation of waking up and living another day? You did that this morning, you woke up, you had breakfast, you're living another day, you are an eigenform for that operation, which doesn't mean you're the same every day, but it means that relative to your own self-observation and presumably the observations of those around you, you are sufficiently identical that you are indistinguishable from the day before. He uses another example, but it's, it's just in passing where he's talking about the flow of water. You know, again, like a classical Heraclitian quip about can't step into the same river twice or even once. 
and yet at the same time, if we go beyond the semantics or at least apply this logic of the eigenform, it may not be the quote unquote same river, but it could be the eigenform of the river, so to speak, or something like this. And that's what's interesting is that the eigenform is something like how the river appears to you yes. for whom it's the same river. That ties a, a nice little bow on this notion of the observer, because he obviously doesn't go into this, but that has all kinds of implications for quantum mechanics and, and whatnot, which is very interested in how observers sort of have these effects on reality or on the particle or, or whatnot. And that's where, in a very different domain, Luhmann draws on the formal system of, of George Spencer Brown, what's called the calculus of indications. Kaufman has written quite a, quite a lot on this as well. And that the point there is that an observation from a purely formal point of view, if you like quantum mechanics is very complicated, you've got all this weird right. math. But if we abstract away from all the math and only focus on the observer-dependent character of, say, the wave collapse, then what you, what you get is an equivalence between observations and distinctions. In other words, to be capable of to observe something is to distinguish various states. So if I observe that it's day, I'm marking a distinction between day and night. And these don't have to be just binary distinctions. That's always the simplest case. But we can't see something if we don't distinguish something from what it is not or the other things that it could be. You can develop this whole theory of the observer and observation on the basis of distinction making. This becomes a very useful way then to think about systems in general in this context of autopoiesis. What is a system? A system is something that distinguishes itself from the environment. If you think about a big chemical soup, whatever, you know, say four billion years ago, the chemical soup isn't going to distinguish some particular autocatalytic network of chemicals. In terms of the chemical soup, everything's just a chemical soup. But at a certain point, once it constitutes maybe a membrane, that's going to be a difference in the environment of something from something else. But the interesting thing is, what is the term that is distinguished from the environment? What is the thing that the distinction distinguishes from the environment? It is itself. This is the point where autopoetic structures emerge is when you get a distinction, but it's a distinction made by that distinction of itself that distinguishes that distinction from that which is non-distinguishable or indistinguished or unmarked. Is that like the repetition of difference or something? Right. And that, that exactly. That <laughs> yeah. I think there's something very close in spirit to, to Deleuze. It's this kind of unilateral creative moment. It's not dialectical, right? Because Interesting. it does involve difference, right? It constructs yeah. a difference, but it doesn't construct a difference on the basis of some unfolding of the self-identical structure of difference. It just constitutes the difference. Interesting. That's where he has to go to the intensive versus the extensive and the intensive versus energy, for example. He'll always kind of come back to, to that where energy is this difference kind of canceled out in extension, blah, blah, blah. But no, for a second there, though, I was starting to have traumatic flashbacks to the beginning of the phenomenology of spirit, you know, where he's <laughs> working out the this and the that and, and, and all and all that shit. And thankfully, you were like, no, it's not dialectical. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> we're, we're okay. We don't have to, we don't have to go through the phenomenology. No, there is something interesting where, you know, that's Hegel could be brought in here, but I'm glad we know <laughs> that for the moment. I like that, you know, we were able to like bring up these like two perfectly classical paradoxes, the paradox of the heap. And and I guess there is something to the Heraclitean river is somewhat similar to the to the heap paradox, but more dynamical, I suppose. And you step into the same Rubicon twice. To the same Rubicon, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the mirror example that he gives, again, as you said, it's oh, yeah, that something that, that most people probably experienced at least once. It reminded me, obviously, of 
inception and I started thinking about of the eigen form of of the dream within a dream within yeah. a dream and that kind of harrowing of hell. Vicious circle. <laughs> this is really good. I don't know if this is worth yeah, mentioning. Please. I can cut this out, but to go back to Freud, what I thought was one of the things he says, and I can't remember if it was in Mystic Writing Pad or not, but he says something about repetition being the mechanism to ward off death. I had this almost like notion that like the machine of life or whatever this it's a machine and it only like its only base operation that it understands is repeating difference is the only way to keep life going or to process going or something like that. This is one of those insights that goes all the way down, right? That even at the the level of the first primitive cell, there's something like a proto anxiety about death because of the very essence of the cell subsisting as nothing more than its own distinction of itself from the environment right that, that there's a precariousness and an, a self operationalizing that is at the heart of every autopoetic system but is also something like the constitutive structure of of finitude and this it, nice. it is an, a, an interesting kind of anecdote. I mean, I was just down in, in Argentina in January. Fernando and Gianluca and I rented an Airbnb for a couple of weeks just to work on, on this book. And somewhat similar to the, the conference in Brazil years and years ago, basically, we have this book contract to write a book on autopoiesis using category theory. And of course, now we actually have to figure out what is our, what is the model of autopoiesis that we want to construct in category theory. We have to have to sort of solve the problem. And so we're, you know, we're working on this hours and hours and going through a lot of material and brainstorming. And finally, you know, after lots and lots of work, we had what, what seemed like a pretty good, basic kind of foundational model where you would essentially have two dynamical systems, one representing the environment and one in representing the system. And then morphisms between these dynamical systems. So we think of the, the environment as always determining the system and the system as always at least recognizing some kind of optim optimal state or optimal transition in the environment. But it was driving me nuts. So we finally found this kind of very simple, clear model that seemed like the right tool for us. But it was driving me nuts that everything was perfectly symmetric, at least mm, formally. Yeah that the system and the environment were just two dynamical systems and that everything was going to be symmetrical, which meant that in the, in the structures that we we're going to build on top of these things, pre-sheaves and co-pre-sheaves, but basically these structures going in, in two different directions, were going to be the same thing. So there was this, this lack of asymmetry that seemed to miss something fundamental. And the solution that we came up with, which is just the, the, the simple, I woke up and I literally like woke up in the morning. And I was like, that's it. And it was the simplest thing, which is that all you need formally to introduce the asymmetry that distinguishes system from environment is that the dynamical system called system has to have a unique system state that is designated death. And death is a fixed point. In other words, once you hit it, you're stuck there. Now, of course, that doesn't solve all the problems, but formally, it is the answer. The environment might very well be finite as well, right? If the environment is like our entire universe, maybe it has some kind of death state. But if we're thinking about what it means for a system to be alive or for a system to be autopoetic, constitutive of that structure is that it can die. So whatever its dynamics are, it doesn't have to die, right? It, in principle, there could be an immortal system, but it has to, formally speaking, include the possibility of death. This, I think, is intrinsic to both why autopoetic phenomena are capable of emerging, but also why, as they self-operationalize, are necessarily caught up in some kind of game structure, right? They necessarily have to anticipate and also enjoy, right? Everything that comes out in Freud about, about pleasure, about the death drive, everything ultimately comes from this unique kind of fixed point of death that is both a final state, but also in some sense, an inaugural state. It's by, by distinguishing that state and distinguishing itself from it that the system becomes a system in the first place.
This is good. It reminds me of two things. One, again, I guess I am bringing up Simone again. Where he, <laughs> he coins the term. Uh, he uses it very literally from the Latin amortization, where mm -hmm. when systems individuate, they are sort of expending a certain amount of elastic possibility and potentiality in order to individuate. And so they're they're sort of weaving in these little called voids or whatever of of death this slow process of literally kind of death on the installment plan right this same like mechanism extends to the cold i mean you already talked about this rocky but i just want to highlight this same kind of simple mechanism repeats itself in culture and insists with memes whether they be the kind that you post online or like the richard richard dawkins meme like that operation of still continuing and that's where i think that this kind of deridian problematic of the archive mm. becomes so interesting you know writing gives us one greater handle on the struggle to escape death we can write something down inscribe it in stone and ensure that memory in a way that at least at a certain scale time scale allows us to forget about the recursive self-operationalizing structure of ordinary life, right? I can't go very long without eating. My organism is going gonna, is gonna to disappear. But if I write something down, I can just put it in a file cabinet and 50 years later, I come back and effectively it hasn't changed. At the end of the day, it's going to deteriorate and disappear. But this seems to be the, you know, the, the tremendous power of, of culture and, and writing and memory is this ability to, to extend the scale of autopoetic reproduction to the point where it seems to be beyond death. You know, we can trust history to be so much longer than us that it might as well be infinite. But that's, I think, one of the fascinating things about our contemporary moment. You know, I think we all feel a kind of apocalyptic character to the planetary conjuncture. And I think it's related to this sense that the, the lifespan of history is part of our kind of visceral experience in a way that, you know, maybe hasn't been the case in previous epochs of humanity. You know, previous epochs of humanity have recognized the mortality of their civilization or their culture, but the mortality of humanity as such, we might be open to it in in some new way i did remember what uh the other thing i was going to respond was your notion of a fixed point death for the asymmetry it reminds me of what guattari specifically writes about and what deleuze and guattari write about in anti oedipus where it's about um you know guattari is thinking about this institutional death drive and you can see it in uh, uh, Guattari's biography, too, and all the different little groups that he was always mingling in and getting into and getting out of and starting up and and letting letting things run their course and then moving on to something else where he's he's thinking about this uh, sort of fighting against the I don't know if neg entropy is the word, but fighting against this like self immortalizing function in certain mm -hmm. institutions like the state, like church's army states which one of these dogs wants to die right like watchery is <laughs> thinking about these mortal formations and how that's a it's actually a a positive thing from the from their understanding of sort of warding off the kind of excesses and and negative outcomes of this uh will to live at any cost if you will and I, and I think that that's so profoundly linked to sexuality, you know, that sexual difference was a really brilliant strategy of life to diversify and in some ways to break with the, you know, let's say the version, the version 1.0 of mm -hmm. autopoiesis, because it's not really clear what reproduces itself through sexual reproduction. Neither organism is, is autopoetic, really, right? Birth isn't the same thing as reproduction of a cell membrane, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. the production of a new individual. And so, you know, the society, sexual society, 
is the thing that reproduces itself with sexual reproduction. But as soon as you as soon as you you talk about sexual society, immediately we're talking about something that is some degree of abstraction, where you know a cell is just a cell. At the end of the day, it's a bunch of molecules. Whereas a a species that reproduces through sexual reproduction has now become ontologically a concrete abstract hybrid, right? It's already cultural in the sense that you can't point to what it is because part of what it is, is this relational and behavioral pattern that is always distinct from any particular concrete instantiation. Yeah. I guess it reminds me of how mathematically formally I'm going to call him Louis still Kaufman. <laughs> he, he, he runs through DNA replication, right? If we have one strand called Crick and one strand Watson, and they interact with the environment and they are encoding for one another, if I'm understanding him right, like they have the blueprint for sort of uh, replicating the other strand and through this complex interaction are able to sort of machine strands of each other that that then interlock in nuanced ways not to get like metaphysically romantic about the union of the sexes right all that but there's something interesting about uh sort of the the hybridization is already yeah. inherent perhaps on the genetic level maybe i'm simplifying what you were articulating no, no, no. I, I think that's one of the things I love in the, the paper. At one point, Kaufman, almost as a kind of aside, he makes a, a formal point about the inevitable existence of fixed points within certain structures. I think he's might be, he might be talking about reflexive, what are called reflexive domains. It's a theorem that under certain conditions, there has to be a fixed point. And in fact, there are a whole bunch of theorems in different contexts where like, you can show, okay, there has to be a fixed point. It's interesting how kind of incessant this kind of structure is. What Kaufman takes this this perfectly formal result and he says, and look, this might very well be why we as human beings and as as cultural beings are so obsessed with mirrors and duplication and paradoxes, which I think is a wonderful insight that you know, the structures of representation and, and mirroring and doppelgangers and doubles, that's not just some like idealist construction that happens to be the case because we're caught up in some prison house of language or some mirror play of, of representation, but it, it goes all the way down that if there's going to be any structure like life, it's going to require some kind of self-duplicating code at the heart of any of these processes is going to be, you know, it's no accident that DNA is a kind of mirroring of chemical structures in a twisted two-sided loop, right? That this is this is like a mirroring at the chemical level that has to be there if structures are going to both reproduce themselves and encode the instructions necessary to reproduce themselves. This is maybe elementary, but the distinction between mitosis and meiosis that you kind of hinted at, I think in terms of maybe even like speed of adaptation or speed of difference just by way of the additional degrees of freedom or something like that conditions a possibility for the organism or the species rather like at the at the macro level whenever you add that additional some type of additional variables or potentials that don't exist under simple mitosis then the organism can really have a better a more robust defense against death because it can sort of experiment in all these different formal structures or something like that not a question per se, but I don't know, just something that came to mind. What that brings to mind for me is, I think, one of the interesting problems in, in trying to develop formal models of autopoiesis, which is the basically the auto part. The poetic part raises a bunch of interesting questions about how, how do things build other things. But often in the literature, the identity conditions are more or less taken for granted. We know what a cell is. The problem is, how does a cell both sustain and reproduce itself. What counts as itself? The deep Nietzschean question of, <laughs> of if we are constituted as wills to power, right, or fields of will to, wills to power, then we reproduce ourselves by overcoming ourselves. 
and interesting, I mean, this is for, you know, again, our, our book is largely about mathematical models of these things, but it, it becomes an interesting formal problem if we want to build in as much creative power, say in the context of evolution, as much adaptive difference as possible in autopoiesis, then you start to have to make constraints on what counts for being the same thing, right? If a species evolves into a completely different species, is that one autopoietic event or two autopoietic events? Even if you solve the problem of continuity, is this species in continuity with this other species? The problem of autopoiesis is slightly different because it's at least in principle possible that it would be a single biological process, but that single biological process would be constituted by two distinct processes of autopoiesis. For example, maybe the development of a new mode of reproduction, like sexual reproduction. For, um, and so the, you know, the identity conditions for an autopoietic system are, are especially interesting questions. Who did we speak to that kind of brought up, was it Ben Woodard? We were discussing creative evolution. Yes. There's like two different distinct processes of evolution going on at different scales or something like that, because they're, this doesn't exactly illustrate this, but there's like phyletic gradualism and then what is it? Punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium. So like both of these evolutionary processes are going on at the same time, but it may right. be at like different scales or something. I don't know. This is, I'm no, I think, I think that. that. I, think that's, I think that's well said. And I think that that, is i think it definitely adds to what what rocky was was going into maybe it is a question of scale too right of, yeah i mean uh, i'm kind of, i don't know if that's the right thing but that's the kind of best way i could explain it it's been so many months since we did that no, discussion. Okay. i mean i think maybe rocky i don't know if that if it makes sense to talk about these distinctions whether it be molar molecular or like synchronic dichronic there's something about that question of well, you were talking about it as this question of, of a continuum, right? Because what I was thinking of when you were speaking as well, just to add on top of Cooper, is this notion of like, you know, species and genera, which we've inherited, you know, from a long history of philosophy. It does seem to bring back in your emphasis on this question of the observer, right? Mm -hmm. This question of where does this new species start? That seems to bring in our whole like, Carolingian classificatory intelligence that wants to put things in, in boxes. Whereas, like to stick with Burke's own, intuition might see a continuum, as you were emphasizing, this continuum of life or something. To shift maybe from the biological models to the more formal mathematical models, that as soon as we actually think of these things as operations, an operation has to operate on discrete operands. An operation has to have inputs and produce some output. Something like a continuous operation is very difficult to work through formally. We want a function to be well-defined in the sense that it takes something as its argument. And that's why, you know, one of the one of the interesting domains for thinking about autopoiesis that was actually, I think first developed by von Neumann. I'm pretty sure he at least developed the thing itself. I'm not sure if he gave the name to it, but what are called cellular automata. And probably the best known of these is like John Conway's Game of Life. We just think of a, a two-dimensional array of boxes, like think of the pixels on a, on a computer monitor. And then you just have a system of local rules that update given, you know, some of these pixels are on, some of them are off. And then there are locally defined rules, say for each pixel, if you think of it as having eight neighbors, all of the pixels kind of that, that surround it, you can formulate a rule, say, that if, if it's surrounded by more than five neighbors, it dies. If you have a, an empty or dead cell that has exactly three neighbors, then maybe it becomes alive. It's like it gives birth to it in some sense. The mathematics of this are they're called cellular automata. They can be in different dimensions and so forth. What makes this such a useful domain for thinking about these processes is you have very clear, discrete components, basically pixels, that can generate structures that the observer, right, we can look from the outside and recognize a shape. 
we can recognize, oh, that looks like a, you know, we look at a computer monitor. We don't see a whole bunch of pixels. We see the image of our friend. And so in that mathematical discrete domain, it's relatively easy to control the difference in level between, let's say, the material reality, which are the pixels, and the ideal gestalt constructions, which are dependent on the observer. And if we then kind of move back from that discrete mathematical domain to the living one, then I think we learn a lot of interesting things that we we spontaneously present that model to ourselves of the physical universe. We presume that things are made up of parts, which are relatively discrete units that are then composed, and those can then be decomposed into further parts. And either we go all the way down to atoms, or maybe we, you know, we have some kind of elementary field structure. It's very difficult to think continuity. Continuity as such breaks with our ordinary analytical mode of yeah. distinguishing the level of what is observed from that out of which it is composed this might be deeply linked to the you know the kind of chemical basis of our encoding of of the living operation the you know the dna reproduction since now bergson's on my mind i'm thinking of him talking about the sub and superhuman rhythms of duration you know mm. there's a there's a sense in which to go with what you're saying about our capacities for observation and our our sort of everyday modes of observation or everyday modes of intelligence, again, kind of in a Bergsonian sense, right? Our, our, our sort of analytic categorical way of thinking, there is the sense in which we perhaps aren't built for seeing continuity where there is. I mean, again, this, this kind of loops back around <laughs> recursively to the heat paradox, right? There is a sense in which, or the, the fucking Heraclitian river, right? Where we want to I guess it's on either side, right? There, there's a sense in which we can add these errors in by seeing continuity where there is none or seeing discreteness where there's continuity. There is a way in which we have to walk this tightrope that perhaps, again, is why the eigenform, as you're saying, is the notion that Kaufman is trying to, to put forward in order to, to help to maybe clear some of these to use another Bergsonian term, these false problems, right, that might arise when we aren't equipped with this type of conceptual apparatus. I think a really interesting connection between Kaufman and Deleuze is the way that the notion of problems and solutions arises for, for thinking of eigenforms. When we talk about an eigenform, we say, oh, it's a something, right? It's something that functions as a kind of fixed point for an operation relative to some observer. But we often can construct an eigenform by treating the desired thing as constituted by the recipe that defines what it has to be, what it necessarily ought to be. And that actually becomes an operation whereby we construct it. Right. So to get to give you an example that kept straight out of Kaufman, if we say, if we take as an operation, draw a circle around something, give me something, I draw a circle around it. Give me a circle, I draw a circle around it. Give me anything, give me a car, I draw a circle around it. Here's my operation, draw a circle. Well, I want an eigenform for this operation. And we might at first, you know, how can I, how can I find something? Because if I take a car and I draw a circle around it, I get something different, right? No matter what I plug in, I'm going to get something different because now I'm going to get that same thing, but with a new circle around it. So it'll be different. I treat the definition of an eigenform as a recipe for building it. So I say the thing I want, call it X, X as a problem, right? X as an unknown. By definition of eigenform, X will be equal to a circle drawn around X by definition of eigenform, right? That's just what we mean by it. But now I treat that equation as the solution to the problem. In what sense? It tells me what to do. Well, I start with X. Well, I have nothing, so I guess I just start with nothing. But my equation tells me that nothing, my X, is the same thing as drawing a circle around it. So what do I do? I draw a circle around nothing. I draw a circle. But now I look at the same equation, and it tells me that X is equal to a circle drawn around X. But now my X is a circle. So a circle is the same thing as 
a circle with a circle drawn around it. So I draw another circle around it. And now I start to see the pattern and I start drawing a circle around a circle around a circle. And I keep doing it until I get a kind of telescoped sequence of circles that to me at least looks infinite, right? Once I've drawn enough circles that I can't count them, then I have the solution to the problem because I have the thing such that iterating the process one time more, drawing another circle around it, doesn't change anything for me. But then what have I just done? I've posed the problem in such a way that the correct posing of the problem actually generates the solution. I don't think this is exactly what Deleuze means when he talks about this new way of thinking about problems and solutions in difference and repetition, but I think it's quite close in spirit. I think it's a nice model because I think that that's one of the more obscure aspects of Deleuze's philosophy is what does he really mean by problems as generative of their solutions? And in some sense, more important or more interesting or more constructive than their solutions. I think this is a really nice model of that. An eigenform isn't interesting in itself. It's interesting as a problem. How do I get an eigenform for this operation? And once I see the problem in the right way, the solution basically comes for free. That's exactly right, because you're, you're, not, you're not tracing the problem from solutions, right? You're not sort of in that begging the question type of thing. And I like this notion of generativity. Obviously, we could look at some of the examples he gives. I know he, his two examples are like, I think it's in logic of sense and difference repetition, where he uses this notion of the two ways of, of generating circles. You know, one sort of um, just points equidistant from a center. But then he has a generative make matrix that's more about like sweeping the yeah. line. So in that sense, you can almost see the, the, the sweeping of the line generating the circle. And I think he draws it from Spinoza. If I remember from, the, yeah. from his lectures, it's that generative matrix that Deleuze wants to say is um, sort of the proper way of, of doing it. And it's there that I think uh, we can see a kind of eigenform-esque type way of doing it. So yeah, I think that, that that fits in nicely. I think that that works. And that's one of the things that I think is, is fascinating about thinking through this stuff is the way that if you tend to do mathematics more on this model, which I think, yeah, to be, to push the interpretation maybe further than is quite warranted to say, you know, a more Deleuzean model, inevitably you plug into computation and robotics. You don't have to think of computation as robotics as, as being like application domains for the real mathematics that takes place inside set theory, right? Or inside basically formal logical systems. I really like the approach that in many ways is becoming more dominant in mathematics, which is to think of computation kind of coming almost first. That computation and, and by extension, maybe robotics is first mathematics. It's not the applied, it's the domain itself. Because mathematics has to be done somewhere. Often the, the brain of the mathematician is the computation device or the, the robot. But mathematics isn't a platonic fixed static domain. It's a bunch of operations. Even if those operations are abstract, there's a, a perfectly rigorous mathematics of computation that doesn't require any questions of hardware, for example, right? Just pure sort of mathematics of computation. But it's a very different way of conceiving mathematics than just doing sort of set theory in the mind of God or in Plato's <laughs> spirit, something like that. Rocky, uh, I do want to give you the chance to maybe reiterate something about your book, maybe when we might see it appear or any last thoughts you might have extending from some of the work you're doing with uh, John Luca Caterina and who is the Fernando Tomei? Fernando Tomei. Okay. I'll ask you this later. Maybe you can you can write out their name so I, I spell it right. I think I have the spelling in my head, but I, I'll double check with you. Anything you want to say about on that front or um or perhaps anything else we can that you've got working? I don't know if this is like your your main project, if you have a side project, but just yeah, with an outro, tell us what we can expect from the future. This is definitely the main project for me right now. Just to kind of describe the project, the title of the book is Autopoietic Systems, 
category theoretical foundations. So we're trying to do two things at once. The first thing is to gather the quite disparate literature on autopoiesis. A lot of people have written on it, and it te- tends to be a kind of archipelago that, you know, you have, for example, Niklas Luhmann in sociology, yep. an enormous body of literature that's grown up around Luhmann's work. Autopoiesis is right at the heart of his whole systems theoretical conception of, of communication, society as communication. But a lot of that literature doesn't really link up, say, with Maturan and Varela at all. Maybe mm. just refers to it, but just treats autopoiesis inside the analysis of social systems. And then you have biologists and philosophers of biology who draw a lot on Maturana and Varela. You have, you know, a huge literature in computer science coming out of von Neumann and, and mathematics of cellular automata. But a lot of these literatures don't really talk to one another. So autopoiesis is a very interesting concept. It's ramified throughout a lot of different disciplines. But it still seems to lack a kind of Kuhnian paradigm. There doesn't seem to be a single generally agreed upon way to identify autopoiesis as something that's happening in all these different domains in a way that has a kind of common theoretical structure. That's so kind I'm of ironic. That's, that's kind of this. ironic, right? Ironic in the sense that you were talking about autopoiesis as a notion that can generalize. Exactly. And it's right. And and the, the, in some sense, the very core of autopoiesis is the problem of the unification of difference. Right. right? Okay. The unity of, of multiplicity. The problem reproduces itself in its mm. own theorization. On the one hand, we just hope that this book can be a kind of source book to gather together a lot of these references so that people interested in autopoiesis can see how these different domains have dealt with the problem. And, you know, the nice thing is the concept is relatively recent. We're going to have yeah. one chapter tracing some of the antecedents of the concept in the history of philosophy. The explicit term autopoiesis is less than 100 years old. And so we've got a relatively narrow historical field to work in. The second part is to try to, in some sense, propose a kind of Kuhnian paradigm for these phenomena. And that's why we think that category theory is the right type of mathematics to do so because it is intrinsically organized around structural relationships. If autopoiesis is by definition the structural characteristic of a system that is capable of reproducing that structure modulo certain variation or difference, there's a kind of structuralism that is baked into the notion of autopoiesis. Autopoiesis is not a theory of physical processes, because even though the autopoetic structures can be grounded in physics, they don't have to be, right? Right. What makes something autopoetic is a structural determination. We think category theory is the right mathematics because it's sufficiently abstract to characterize the way autopoiesis is a structure referring to other structures. And basically, at the end of the day, we're using category theory and the, the construction of a class of pre-sheaves over a relatively simple base category as a way to think about the dynamics of these systems interacting with their environments. And then the the main kind of theoretical contribution, or if I'd say frame for our formal contribution, is to think of every autopoetic system as, in some sense, wagering, maybe to come back to, you know, our, our work, uh, mm-hmm. Taylor, in, in translating Laurel's non-standard philosophy, the, you know, Laurel talks about the wager of non-philosophy, that every autopoetic system is making a wager, placing a kind of bet on some combination of two types of strategy with respect to its system reproduction and updating. Mm. And those two types of strategy are autonomization. In general, a system can maximize its ability to be what it is, regardless of how the changes in the environment perturb it. So trying to self-autonomize so that it's less and less dependent on environmental differences. The other class of strategies is interdependence, to organize itself in relation to the environment in such a way that it's more and more symbiotic with respect to similarly autopoetic systems that are developed 
in the environment. And we could, you know, think of this maybe, I mean, it's a very rough analogy, but the hunter gatherer strategy versus maybe an agricultural strategy. Do you build things in the environment that you depend on, or do you become a better and better warrior or a better and better hunter so that no matter what happens, you're always going to be able to get food for yourself? These two types of strategy, autonomization, interdependence, always interact with each other to give a, a particular kind of flavor to any given autopoietic system. Every autopoietic system is, is playing the game with itself. To what extent should I emphasize one or the other of these kind of basic, at the end of the day, ethical paths? Right, right. right. I like how you, how you you point towards that that question of, of an ethics because that leaves some food for thought and leaves uh some space to ruminate on what the outcomes for this type of investigation could be and doesn't leave it a, as a purely scholastic matter because at yeah, the end I, of the day it's 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 not and and it we we could be led otherwise from the deeply uh philosophical and and analytical ways that which we've described some of these things just to get the the definitional groundwork afoot but the fact that that there would be ethical implications political implications i'm glad that you landed you stuck the landing rocky i i appreciate that <laughs> that was all kind of also kind of gesturing to that what i i think the germ of what i was trying to communicate with regard to like the different models of phyletic gradualism and punctuated equilibrium, right? Like there's two different mechanisms operating at the same time that are mm -hmm. in dynamic dialogue with one another or mm -hmm. interaction. No, I, I which I is pretty cool. Like that's, 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 that's good. interesting. What about publication date? Do you uh, think that well, that's, or is it still in the writing? We don't, you don't have a finished text, do you? No, we're, we're in definitely in the process of, of writing. We got a lot of work done down in Argentina in January. We have a, a very detailed table of contents. We've worked out the outline all the way down to the sub sub sections of every chapter. <laughs> so we know all exactly right. what it is we're going to cover and exactly the order. But in terms of the actual writing, we still have a huge amount of work to do. Gotcha. But we're also on a, on a deadline. We're supposed to be done this summer. So the book... I think it would be pushing it to say that it'll come out in 2024, but with luck, it would come out in early 2025. Rocky, we I enjoyed having you on again. I know, Coop, you were the one that that told me because I, I already you already knew I, my relationship with with Rocky. So the fact that that Coop, you were you were gunning for for having Rocky back. We both appreciate your time. We'll let you get back to your Sunday and maybe get back to writing some of those <laughs> subsections. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but hey, hey, I mean, around the time, either the or for both, I mean, it'd be great, obviously, when the Laurel translation gets close to publication yeah, and too. probably maybe around the same time in 2025. It'd be nice to have you back. And if we can perhaps get your colleagues, John Luca and you said Fernando. Fernando, yeah. We can get if we can get you know a whole panel together for the book that'd be launch. Great. Yeah, that'd be know, so at least one of those or both sometime next year to check in and uh, if we have a physical copy of the Laura Well, it'd be it'd be fun to at least talk about some of the some of the things in there. Uh, we'll see, but it'd be but it would also be cool to have your friends on once you guys uh, achieve this because it sounds uh, it sounds honestly fascinating. I, lo I love working on projects. It's a blast. <laughs> and yeah, I really appreciate, you know, being able to to talk with the two of you. And one of these days I would love, you know, hopefully next time we can get together, can you know, be over a beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, gosh, I, once um we're kind of coming up your way, not maybe not I'd have to see how close on a map in my head it's closer. Uh <laughs> in May, we're going up to uh Gettysburg, a friend of ours, is hosting a uh, a conference, and uh, I'm not exactly sure. That's probably still a few hours drive. Yeah, that would from... be at least probably at least three or four hours. I think. Yeah, but yes, we'll have to get together at some point to celebrate the Laurel publication. But until then, enjoy the rest of your your Sunday. I appreciate you spending time with us, and uh, really enjoyed our conversation today. And we're going to just stay on for a moment to talk about um, our upcoming 
episode next week but cool. um this will probably drop and i'll be in touch obviously this will probably drop in about three weeks mid-april but i'll be in touch before then if not on the day of the episode dropping and then we can just look forward to hearing back from uh from our editor on on the laura well publication and we got some stuff to look forward to in the future but uh Again, thanks for uh, thanks for spending time with us today, Rocky. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks so much. And yeah, Cooper is great to likewise, likewise. Talk with you as well. Great. All right, take care, guys. Have a Cheers. great day. Yeah, you guys too. Bye bye. Thanks to Rocco Gangle for joining Taylor and I on this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. This is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.